Greetings students and welcome back to my fluid mechanics playlist. In this video I'm going to derive Poisson's law, which is essentially a relationship between the pressure drop across a pipe, the volume flow rate through the pipe, and the radius of that pipe. Let's begin. Suppose that I have a cylindrical pipe of radius capital R with a uniform cross-sectional area A throughout its length L. So to start off I'm going to draw a longitudinal section of the pipe of length L, and I'm also going to draw the circular cross-section of the pipe of radius R. Next we'll suppose that there's an incompressible Newtonian fluid, so something like water for example, inside this pipe. There's also a pressure gradient from the left end of the pipe to the right end of the pipe, such that the pressure at the left is greater than the pressure at the right. Because there's a pressure difference from left to right, that would compel the fluid inside to flow from left to right. In other words, the pressure difference would give rise to a fluid velocity. We want to ultimately determine the distribution of the fluid velocity in this pipe because that's how we'll find the relationship between the pressure drop and the pipe radius. That's how we'll derive Poisson's law. Fortunately, there are equations we can solve to determine the exact distribution of the fluid velocity, and those include the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equations. Now since the geometry of the pipe is cylindrical, it would be easiest to use cylindrical coordinates when writing down our equations. And if we do that, here's what our four equations, one for continuity and three for the Navier-Stokes in each of the three dimensions, here's what our four equations will look like. Again, these equations only apply to an incompressible Newtonian fluid, which is what we've assumed here. Just note that mu is the viscosity of the fluid, rho is the fluid density, r, theta, and z are the radial, angular, and axial cylindrical coordinates respectively, v is the fluid velocity, and v with a subscript means a particular velocity component. p also means the pressure. Now in general when our fluid is traveling down this pipe it will have a longitudinal velocity that I'll call vz. It'll have a radial velocity that I'll call vr, and it'll have an angular velocity that I'll call v theta. But if we directly try to solve these four sets of equations to determine the velocity and pressure distribution in the pipe, we would go insane. So it's far better to simplify the Navier-Stokes equations before we actually start solving them. And we can do that since the problem we're solving is relatively simple. So to start off our simplification process, we're going to assume that the flow is steady, which means that all our time derivatives can be eliminated. We'll also assume that gravity doesn't play a role, so all our rho g terms will cancel out. Next, we'll say that our radial velocity v sub r is zero. The reason is that intuitively, if you picture a fluid traveling down a stationary and uniform pipe, there's nothing else about the system that would make you think that the fluid is getting repelled from the walls or attracted to the walls. There are no radial forces acting on the fluid. The only notable forces are acting longitudinally due to the pressures at either ends. As a result, the radial velocity is zero throughout the pipe, which means we can cancel all terms related to VR. Similarly, the angular velocity V theta is also zero. Again, if you picture fluid traveling through a stationary and uniform pipe, there's no reason to think that the fluid will be spinning inside the pipe. There's no rotational forces that would cause that to happen. As a result, the angular velocity is zero throughout the pipe, which means we can cancel all terms related to V theta. That would mean that my continuity equation is just dVz by dz equals zero, while well, my first two Navier-Stokes equations just say that the pressure gradients in the radial and angular directions are both zero. But what about the longitudinal velocity vz? Well, from the continuity equation, dvz by dz is zero, so we can cancel out that term and its corresponding second derivative. In addition, vz does not depend on the angle theta because of the symmetry of our cylinder. There's no reason to think that vz over here will be any different from a vz that's a certain angle away from it. This means that after simplification, we need to solve this relatively simple second order ODE. And the reason it's an ODE is that the pressure and velocity both only depend on one variable, since I just showed that their derivatives with respect to other variables are all zero. Now, 
This pressure gradient in the z direction looks a bit annoying, but what we can do here is assume that it's a constant equal to PR minus PL over L, which is an assumption that experiments agree with. So let's start solving this ODE by multiplying both sides by R and integrating both sides. In that case, we'll have R dVz by dr equals R squared over 2 mu times PR minus PL over L plus C1, where C1 is a constant of integration. Now if we divide both sides by R and integrate that, we'll end up with an expression for Vz as a function of R, and that's given by Vz of R equals PR minus PL over 4 mu L times R squared plus C1 ln R plus C2, where C2 is another constant of integration. Now the question remains, how do we find C1 and C2? We use the boundary conditions. The first boundary condition is that at R equals 0, Vz is finite, which means that this natural log term shouldn't be there, and so C1 equals 0, because the natural log at R equals 0 is undefined. The other boundary condition is what we call a no-slip boundary condition, according to which the velocity of the fluid at the wall has to be zero. The fluid cannot slide against the wall, it cannot slip against the wall. So if we plug in Vz equals zero at R equals capital R, then we'll find that C2 is negative capital R squared over four mu L times PR minus PL. So therefore, the axial or longitudinal velocity of the fluid is a parabolic function that is maximum at the center. What I'm going to do now is define a parameter delta p as pl minus pr, in which case this is what my velocity profile equation will look like. Now how do we take this velocity profile and come up with Poisson's law from that? Well, I mentioned at the start that Poisson's law is a relationship between the pressure drop, the volume flow rate, and the radius of the pipe. So let's use our velocity profile to calculate the volume flow rate of the fluid through the pipe. But how do we do that? How do we take the velocity profile of the fluid and calculate the volume flow rate? Well, let's go back to our circular cross section. If my axial velocity through that cross section is Vz of R, then the volume flow rate through an infinitesimally small area dA is dQ equals Vz times dA, because the volume flow rate is just velocity times cross sectional area. And so through this infinitely small section dA, the volume flow rate would be Vz times that area dA. If we integrate this expression over the entire cross section, then we'll get the volume flow rate Q, which is the integral of Vz dA. Now in cylindrical coordinates, we can express dA as R dr d theta, with the limits R double integral being from zero to capital R and from zero to two pi. So if we plug in our Vz of R, then we can determine our volume flow rate by evaluating this double integral. Let's compute the first of the double integrals, you know, the one involving R. If we multiply in the R outside, then the term in the parentheses becomes capital R squared R minus R cubed. And if we integrate this whole expression, we'll end up with capital R squared times R squared over two minus R to the four over four. If we now apply the limits of integration, we'll end up with Q equals the integral from zero to two pi of delta P over four mu L times capital R to the four over four. But there's still one more integration to do, and that's from zero to two pi. But since there's no other term involving theta in the integral, we can just separate the theta integral from everything else. And if we evaluate that theta integral, we'll get two pi, which means that our volume flow rate is pi times capital R to the four times delta P over eight mu L. Now if we rearrange this equation to solve for the pressure difference delta P, we'll get delta P equals eight mu L Q over pi times capital R to the four. And this expression is called Poisson's law, that the pressure difference across a pipe is inversely proportional to the radius of that pipe to the power four. Now before I end this video, let me take some time to briefly talk about the medical significance of this capital R to the four dependence. If you're a medical student, then you would much rather skip the math and go straight to the clinical application. Anyway, suppose our cylindrical pipe was an artery and that the fluid inside was blood. I'm aware that blood isn't exactly Newtonian and that our arteries aren't exactly uniform, but it's a good enough approximation. If our peripheral blood vessels constrict, that means the radius of those blood vessels drops, 
and if capital R drops, the pressure difference across those vessels, in other words our blood pressure, increases. Physiologically, this is what happens thanks to the renin-angiotensin system when the blood pressure drops. When the blood pressure drops, the renin-angiotensin system gets activated and one of the downstream effects is to constrict our peripheral blood vessels, which according to Poisson's law will bring our blood pressure back up again. Of course, this is very high yield to know and board examiners love going after this. Now another implication of Poisson's law is in the pathophysiological state. If you've got high cholesterol and there's a cholesterol plaque that's deposited on your coronary artery, the artery which applies to the heart muscle, then because the volume flow rate of blood is proportional to the fourth power of capital R, it doesn't take much of a plaque deposit to cause a significant change in volume flow rate. For instance, if the plaque deposit was enough to have the radius of the coronary artery, then the flow rate would fall by a factor of 16 according to this equation, which is a ridiculously large decrease. So individuals who do have these partially occluding plaques in their coronary arteries often get chest pain when they exercise, because there isn't enough blood flow to the heart muscle to supply sufficient nutrients and oxygen under these stressful conditions. Of course, the body does have other mechanisms to compensate, but this shows how much of an impact a change in radius can have on how much blood gets applied to the heart muscle. Anyway, that should do it for the lecture. I'd just like to finish off by thanking the following patrons for donating at the $5 level or higher to my Patreon. If you would like to become a patron, I've put a link to my Patreon account in the description and you can support me there if you want. So that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of On, signing out.